Discover the exquisite beauty of Islam with our exclusive poster collection showcasing the 99 names of Allah. Each poster meticulously presents the Arabic name, pronunciation and English translation, embodying the essence of our Creator. Elevate your surroundings with these high-quality designs that not only serve as art, but also offer a glimpse into the profound beauty of Islamic culture. Immerse yourself in the collection and unveil the magnificence of the 99 names. Links in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, oftentimes people forget that I am a revert to Islam. I have been a Muslim now for roughly one year, alhamdulillah. But that means that I myself am of course learning every single day. I have so much of catching up to do because I haven't been born into a Muslim family. I have to learn everything from scratch, be it the prayer be it Arabic, be it Wudu, or lastly but most importantly, the correct Akida. So the Akida in Islam is essentially the creed, which is a fancy word for belief system in English. So the creed encompasses the core belief systems that a Muslim holds about their faith. That encompasses the prophets, the angels, revealed scriptures, day of judgment, divine decree, but most importantly of course, who is Allah? This is the most important, crucial thing, of course, to understand in Islam who Allah is. Because if you look into different creeds, such as the Nicene Creed of the Christians, we will find out that they proclaim that God, i.e. Allah, is three in one. He is supposedly the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, all united in one triune God. As Muslims, we see this as blasphemy, of course. We see this as shirk, as attributing partners to God. And therefore, yet again, it is crucial to understand who God in Islam is. Therefore, today I want to read out Al Aqida Al Tahawiya by Imam Al Tahawi. Imam Al Tahawi was a Hanafi jurist and a traditional theologian. His work, Al Aqida Al Tahawiya, is a summary of the Sunni Islamic creed. I believe that this text is very important for Muslims that have never read it. But more importantly, I believe that this text is truly crucial for non Muslims in order to understand who Muslims actually worship. I believe that this text truly resonates with every human being. Why is that so? Because as Muslims, we believe in the fitra. The fitra is the innate predisposition, a natural predisposition of men to worship one God alone. Essentially a natural instinct that resonates with the truth. Once you're presented with the truth, you feel it in your heart. You know that it's true. But then your ego might come into play and tell you, oh, well, this is not for me. No, this is not what I believe, etc., etc. But the truth resonates with you internally. And this is why, yet again, I truly believe that this text is absolutely crucial for everybody out there. Because this text implies Tawhid, the oneness of God. And I'm certain that this resonates with every Everybody on a fundamental core level. But anyways, enough babbling here, guys. Before we jump into the video, please do me the favor. If you enjoy my work, leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. El Akida El Tahawiya in English and Arabic. Today, obviously, we're just going to read the English translation. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful from whom we seek help. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. This is a clear presentation of the creed of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jamaa, according to the doctrine of the jurists of the religion, Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim, al-Ansari, and Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani. May Allah be pleased with them all, and what they believe regarding the fundamentals of the religion and their faith in the Lord of the worlds. Monotheism. We say about the oneness of Allah, believing in the guidance of Allah, that Allah is one without any partner. There is nothing like him. There is nothing that can weaken him. There is nothing worthy of worship but him. 
He is the eternal without a beginning and enduring without end. He will never perish nor come to an end. Nothing happens except what he wills. No imagination can fully conceive of him. No understanding can fully comprehend him. He does not resemble any created being. He is living and he never dies. Always sustaining and never sleeping. He creates without a need to create. And he provides for his creation without any effort. He causes death with no fear of consequences. And he resurrects without any difficulty. He has existed with his timeless attributes before his creation, which added nothing to his essence that was not already among his attributes. As his attributes were before creation, so will they continue forever. It is not because he created the creation that he earned the name the creator, nor by his making it did he earn the name the maker. He has the quality of lordship without requiring anything to lord over, and the quality of being the creator without requiring anything to create. Just as he resurrects the dead after they first had life, he deserved his name before he brought them to life. Likewise, he deserved the name of the creator before he produced them. This is because he has power over all things, and all things are in need of him. Every matter is easy for him. He has no need of anything, for there is nothing like unto him. And he is the hearing, the seeing. He created the creation with his knowledge. He decreed destinies for them. He set for them lifespans. Nothing was hidden from him before he created them. He knew what they would do before he created them. He commanded them to obey him and he forbade them to disobey him. Everything that occurs is according to his decree and will. His will is always accomplished. The will of the servants is only what he wills for them. Whatever he wills for them comes to be. And whatever he does not will for them does not come to be. He guides whomever he wills. He protects them and secures them as grace. He leads astray whomever he wills. He humiliates them and he puts them to trial in justice. All of them go back and forth by his will, between his grace and his justice. He is exalted beyond having opposites or partners. None can repel his decree, amend his judgment or overpower his command. We believe in all of this. We are certain that it is all from him. Alright guys, and this is it. This is Al-Aqida al, al tahawiyah by Imam al tahawi Absolutely amazing, mesmerizing, breathtaking summary of who Allah is, what Muslims are supposed to believe. And most people, believe it or not, do not understand that this is the creed of Islam. They do not understand what the difference truly is because they've been told well, there are monotheistic religions and then there are polytheistic religions, right? The big three Abrahamic faiths, they're all monotheistic without really reflecting upon it because the claims of those religions are very, very different, especially if you look into Christianity, as I said in the beginning, they claim that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are supposedly one God, one triune God, whatever that means. So the Islamic creed goes in direct opposition to that, of course, and proclaims Tawhid, not the Trinity, but the pure monotheism, the pure unity of God. This becomes very obvious, of course, if you look into the text again under monotheism. The description is clear. There is nothing like him, which means automatically that there is nothing that you can imagine. There is nothing that you ever saw in this creation that could be God. And that automatically then excludes, of course, the Christian claims such as Jesus being God, because Jesus is a human and a human is nothing like him because there's literally nothing like him within creation. So this sentence alone already defines so much of the Islamic creed. It is so simple, so straightforward. And again, I'm 100% convinced that that resonates with the human heart. There is nothing 
like him. There is nothing that can weaken him. This goes directly against certain Jewish claims, of course, that God came to earth as a man and wrestled and lost that wrestling match. Or even worse, God debated with the rabbis and he lost the debate, of course, which would be then an admission to weakness. But there is nothing that can weaken God. He is the Almighty after all. And this directly leads to the next sentence, there is nothing worthy of worship but him. Exactly, because he is the absolute, there is nothing like him yet again, and therefore there is nothing worthy of worship but him. This is so logical, so pragmatic, so rational. Only someone that is trapped within his ego would fight against those words. So then the text proceeds absolutely beautifully yet again. He is the eternal, without a beginning, and enduring, without an end. All of those things the Christians allegedly believe as well, but at the same time they're neglecting their own statements because then they claim that God came into the flesh. And with that said, God had a beginning. <laughs> they even go so far that God had a mother. After all, the Theotokos, Mother Mary gave birth to God. By that admission, Mary is above God already. Because if you can give birth to a being, that automatically makes you more powerful, of course, because you created that being. This sentence here cements it once and for all. No imagination can fully conceive of him. No understanding can fully comprehend him which means that our imagination and our understanding as humans are limited, but God, Allah, is limitless, and therefore you cannot fit the infinite into your finite mind. It is impossible, and that is the beauty of it. This is why the atheistic claim fails as well, because the atheist, with his limited evolutionary mind, wants to wrap his mind around the infinite, the limitless. This is a contradiction, this is impossible. And here we have another sentence that goes directly against the Christian doctrine yet again. He is living and he never dies, always sustaining and never sleeping. Which ultimately means, of course, that if Jesus is God and he died, even if it was just for a second and then he rose again, he would be gone, he would be dead, and therefore he would not be there to sustain the universe. Therefore, the Christians use their loophole and say, yeah, well, Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. The Father was always in heaven and he was monitoring everything that was going on. But if you claim that, yet again, you cannot claim co-equality. Because if Jesus can die and the Father can not die, that makes him non-equal. It's that simple because then you have a being that is eternal, a being that never dies, and you have a being that can die. The next sentence is actually very, very deep if you reflect upon it. He creates without a need to create. And he provides for his creation without any effort. Which means that God is absolutely perfect and he has no need for this creation whatsoever. He creates it out of his mercy, if you will, but there is no need for it. But yet again, if we look into the Christian doctrine, somehow God created us and then he sees that we are evil, we have the original sin and now he needs to forgive us. He has the need to forgive us and in order to forgive us, he needs to incarnate into flesh and then die for our sins. And in Islam, you can clearly see, we say that there is no need for that whatsoever. If Allah wants to forgive us, he forgives us. I want to end it with this sentence here. He guides whomever he wills. He protects them and secures them as grace. He leads astray whomever he wills. He humiliates them and he puts them to trial in justice. So when people hear, oh, he humiliates, or what is often quoted by certain Christians as well is, oh, Allah is the best of deceivers. <laughs> The point of the story is they don't understand, because within the Christian doctrine, the deceiver would be the devil. But by believing that the devil is the deceiver and he's so extremely powerful, they are actually attributing a contrary to God. They see the devil as an equal almost to God. Essentially a yin and yang philosophy, if you will. Where there is light, there must be darkness. This is a duality of sorts, and therefore you have equal powers. No. No, of course not. 
God is so exalted, he's so much higher than any of his creations, and therefore the devil has absolutely no chance against God. He's just a creation of God. If God truly wanted the devil to be gone, he would just say, be gone, and he would be gone. But the Christians attribute so much power to the devil, they essentially made him a second God. This is truly what they did. And therefore, when they hear, huh, Allah can deceive you? Oh, that means Allah is evil. No, it simply means that everything happens within Allah's will. If he wants you to be guided, you will be guided. If he wants you to be astray, you will be astray. It is all within Allah's will. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. Absolutely amazing read. Please let me know what you think in the comment section. And if you enjoy my work here, as I said in the beginning, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below, guys, to further support my work. I couldn't do it without you. All right, but this is it for today. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. <laughs> Oh